Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. everybody, welcome to the Dinosaur George Podcast. This is episode number 104. In this episode, our feature creature is Spiclipius Shiporum. If you don't know the name of that animal, uh, you're going to when we're done. It is a very, very cool new discovery, and uh, I think you're going to love it. We have an interview with paleontologist Dr. Jordan Mallon from Ottawa, Canada. Great interview. You definitely want to hear it. And then at the end, we'll do some Ask Dinosaur George questions, that is, answer questions submitted by you, the listener. So sit back and relax, get ready to learn about an amazing new discovery, and uh, let's go. It's time for our feature creature segment. If you would like to suggest a creature, go to dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com and post it in the comments section of this episode. Or email us your suggestions to contact at dinosaurgeorge.com. And now, and now, our feature creature. Spiclipius Shaporum is the feature creature for this episode. This is a Ceratopsian, a newly described Ceratopsian. Uh, Ceratopsians are the dinosaurs that include things like Triceratops and uh, Styracosaurus and, and all of those kind of critters. Its name in English means spiked shield, but uh, it's, it's, it's a great name. It's a cool dinosaur. I, I would recommend you go online. Its name is spelled S as in Sam, P-I-C-L-Y-P-E-U-S, Spiclipius. I recommend you go take a look at some of this because the, the images are simply great. Now, again, it's a member of the Ceratopsian family. This dinosaur lived in the late Cretaceous period about 76 million years ago, and it was found in a place called Winifred, Montana. They were up to about 20 feet long and weighed probably up to maybe three tons, and it was a quadruped herbivore, which in English means it walks on four legs and it eats plants. Now, normally I'd give more details about our feature creature, but we're fortunate enough to have with us a scientist who probably knows more about Spiclipius than anyone else because he named it. He is a research scientist and paleobiologist from the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, Canada, Dr. Jordan Mallon. Dr. Mallon, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you for having me, George. You bet. Okay, so before we be, before we talk about this amazing dinosaur, tell us a little bit about you, about yourself. Like, where were you from? Where did you grow up? Education? Just give us a little background. Sure. Um, so I was actually born where I'm working now in Ottawa, Ontario, which is in Canada. And uh, I grew up going to where I work now, the, the Canadian Museum of Nature. <laughs> Uh, so that's really where I, I, I saw my first dinosaurs on display here. We had, you know, beautiful Displetosaurus skeleton relative of T-Rex. And I remember staring a lot at uh, the Hypacrosaurus skeleton, which is a duck-billed dinosaur. And so I knew at a, at a young age, coming to this museum, that I, I wanted to study dinosaurs and, and be a paleontologist. Um, I ended up going to uh, Carleton University here in Ottawa to do my undergraduate degree in paleontology. Um, and then went off to uh, west uh, to Alberta to do my PhD out at the University of Calgary there under the uh, supervisorship of, of Dr. Jason Anderson. Uh, and then I came back here. I was lucky enough, the timing worked out, that I landed a, a postdoc uh, fellowship here, which is just basically a sort of a contract work position at the museum. And uh, within the year, I, I got a full-time job here. So. Wow. Um, very happy, very lucky to, you know, it's pretty rare for a paleontologist to be able to work in their hometown. Yeah. Uh, so I count my blessings every day that I'm able to do that. That's amazing. You know, when, when you, you mentioned when you were a kid and you walk in the museum and you see those skeletons, it is amazing the impact that can have on someone. And obviously in your case, you're back there with those same skeletons, which is, which is pretty remarkable. 
Yeah, and and what's great is we've long since renovated the the fossil gallery since I was a kid, but a lot of those original skeletons are are still on display, uh, just you know, in a different area of the museum with very different lighting. When I was a kid, the fossil gallery was very dark and very ominous. The dinosaurs sort of <laughs> loomed over you, very poorly, dimly lit. You know, you felt like you were walking through a cave at times. Now they're a lot more brightly lit. You can see a lot more detail on them. I, I suspect it's got a very different effect on the kids that look at them now. But I, I think either way, uh, you know, for any child then or now, they're still quite imposing. Right. Well, you know, I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about the museum at the end because um, from what I understand, it's pretty remarkable. One other thing I want to ask you, do you get an opportunity to do a lot in the field? Are, are you out excavating in the field, and what is that like? Yes. Uh, in fact, I only got back from field work maybe, what, a week and a half ago or so? Well, not quite two weeks ago. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm typically out in the field every summer for usually about a month um, doing uh, field work for the last four years in Alberta. And for the last, what, two years now, I've, I've also been working in Montana. Um, so it's, what's it like? It's very different from the office. <laughs> you sort of, you know, one day you're sitting in your air conditioned office and responding to emails and the next day you're setting up your tent in the middle of, a, of an abandoned farmer's field. And, you know, it takes a few days to sort of accept that this is how it's going to be and to, uh, try and forget the comforts of <laughs> living, but, you know, in air conditioning with delicious food around and uh no bugs you know uh, yeah it takes it takes a bit to acclimatize <laughs> we watch on television these excavation sites and movies and and you see the paleontologist sitting in these these winnebagos these travel these these big motorhomes air conditioning dinner being cooked on a stove so that's not what you experience then well, not me personally. Certainly some do, and, you know, some of us are better off than others. I, I, I tend to run a fairly small uh, uh, field camp. We don't have a lot of people in paleo here at the museum. We're, we're a small group, and I tend to run a small camp. Uh, we, we, we all live out of tents, effectively, uh, which is pretty much the norm. We have a big mess tent, which, again, is pretty much the norm. We got a really big one this year. We, we sprang for a... a what is it, 14 by 16 foot mess tent. So, oh, wow. Uh, you know, on the whole, we, we live pretty well. We've got access to a well on site, so we've got really good drinking water. We've got, um, we've got electricity, so we, I think even this year we bought a, a coffee uh, pot so we can make coffee. Uh, and uh, we also have, we're one of the few crews that I know of that has Wi-Fi in camp. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, well, what, as I say, we're in an abandoned farm field, but the, the farmer next door um, has a well on site, and he monitors his well and manages his well using the Wi-Fi signal. So he lets us tap into Wi-Fi, and we can tweet from the field, we can blog from the field, uh, answer our email. So it, it it makes it great. Actually, I did I did some uh, some Skype chats with some kids back at the museum while I was in the field this year too, which was uh, a real treat to. to be able to report live from the field what we've been finding so it's been a lot of fun man well you know even if it's as as difficult as as i suspect it is you're still doing what you love and so that's got to be worth it all oh absolutely yeah yeah you know it's 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 hard when you're in the field sometimes you know the the temperature reaches you know 100 degrees uh, during the day and and it's sweltering and you're kind of feeling miserable but you just remind yourself that you know how many people would kill for this job, <laughs> right? <laughs> and 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 you forget all the hardships. Come, uh, you know, when it's February and you're in your office and you're you're too cold and you're wishing you were back in the field. You only remember the good things. You remember the thrill of discovery. Uh, you know the friendships that you make. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for for anything. That's that's exciting. So let's talk about Spiclipius. Tell us about this this dinosaur you affectionately, I think you you nicknamed it Judith. Tell tell us a little bit about this thing. Sure. Well, Spiclipius was one of the the horn dinosaurs, and I often draw reference to Triceratops when I talk about the horn dinosaurs, just because I think that's one that everyone can think of. Um, so as a horn dinosaur, uh, Spiclipius had uh, walked on all four legs. It was a quadruped. It had a big horny beak at the front of its mouth and jaws lined with 
multiple rows of, of teeth for eating plants. Um, and it was probably somewhere on the order of upwards of, say, 20 feet long, a uh, few tons, very likely, in weight. Um, and like all the other horned dinosaurs, it had this very large frill coming off the back of its head. Uh, and what sets Spiclipius apart from the other horned dinosaurs uh, is the orientation of the various knobs and spikes and protrusions that come off the back of the frill. So I sometimes describe it as almost looking like a, like a cresting tidal wave. Uh, if you start at the, the middle of the frill, uh, the horns that curl off the back curl forward, and then as you move outwards towards either side of the back of the frill, those horns give way to backwards pointing spikes. So that's very unique. And of course, being a horned dinosaur, they also have horns over the eyes. And in Spiclipius, those horns point out sideways, which is fairly rare uh, to see that among horned dinosaurs. Usually they, they project outwards if there are any horns. But in Spiclipius, they point out sideways. So God. it's very distinctive in that way. You wouldn't mistake it for any other horned dinosaur. What a, what a strange configuration. Well, uh, you described it. Now, I, I read articles in, recently where you have described the species. Can you explain to, to all of the listeners, and especially to some of the kids, what does it mean when it says a paleontologist has described a specimen or species? Yeah, well, anytime you, you think you've dug up a new species uh, and you want to give you know, your specimen uh, a new name, uh, you want to coin a new name for your species. You, what you have to do is uh, you have to follow the rules of taxonomy, that is the science of naming a new animal, and describe the animal. You have to describe what, what the features are that set it apart uh, from other similar animals. So in this case, uh, in the paper that I wrote uh, in PLOS One, I, I paid particular attention to describing those features that I just mentioned that set it apart from the other horned dinosaurs like Triceratops or like, oh, I don't know, Chasmosaurus or other members of, of its family. Um, and you also have to designate what's called uh, a holotype specimen. And what a holotype is, is it's effectively sort of the first specimen of the species. It's, it's the touchstone uh, specimen. So if someone else were to, say, dig up another fossil somewhere in Montana and they thought it was Spiclipius too, well, they would have to come and see the holotype. That is the original specimen that the species name was given to. And that is now here at the Museum of, of Nature in Ottawa. And as, as you mentioned, the, the holotype was nicknamed uh, Judas. So it's Judas that you would want to uh, compare your fossil to. Um, and so we, we designate that holotype in the description as well um, so that everyone knows what specimen it is they need to look at. Wow. So the name, explain how you arrived at the name and how, how do paleontologists choose the names? Oh, good question. So, well, first, the full, the scientific name of this animal uh, is Spiclipius shiporum. So it's a two-part name. Uh, Spiclipius is the genus name, and shiporum is what we call the species epithet. Uh, uh, Spiclipius is actually Latin for spiked shield, just in reference to those big spikes that come off the, the back of the frill that I mentioned, or some people call it a head shield, which is why we went with spiked shield. Uh, I was, you know, I've had various people, some people like the name, some people don't like the name, and that's true of any name, any dinosaur name you could pick. Right. I always liked, I always liked Spiclipius. I thought it sounds sort of like a strong, you know, Roman soldier, or Roman ruler, very strong sounding, which is why I went with it. Um, and, and the species epithet, uh, the species name Shiporum, honors Bill Ship uh, and, and his family. Uh, Bill Ship is actually the man who originally uh, discovered uh, Judith uh, Spiclipius, the fossil skeleton, on, on his land in Montana. And the museum was able to acquire uh, the fossil from him, which is why we named it uh, in order to honor him in that way in his, in his family. So Shiporum just again, honors the ship family name, basically. So all, and you had a second part. Yep, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, all dinosaurs, then they have a first and last name, technically? Effectively, yeah. And that's true not just of, of dinosaurs, but, but any you know species 
uh, the human species, of course, is Homo sapiens. So that has a two-part name. Uh, and, of course, the other example we often give is Tyrannosaurus rex. That has the two-part name as well. We often only refer to uh, the first part of the name, the genus name, uh, just because, I don't know, maybe we're lazy or it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so often I'll speak of Spiclipius and not just and not Spiclipius Shiporum as a whole. Uh, and, and part of that is also a lot of these dinosaurs only have one species within the genus. And so it's a, almost redundant to say uh, both names. Uh, in this case, Spiclipius, there's only a single species in that genus. So to say Spiclipius is virtually the same thing as saying Spiclipius Shiporum. Right. Um, we're, we're referring to the same thing. Right. Okay. So you you do all this research that basically your research when you describe you're you're describing why it's not somebody else at the same time describing why it is a new species. Then right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because the first time you f- find a fossil, you, you effectively have to convince yourself that it's. And if you think it's something new, you you really have to make that case. Uh, there have been all kinds of of fossils found previously that were thought to be something new. They were given a name, and then later on it was realized, oh, well, you know, this was actually maybe just a, a juvenile of a species that had already been named uh, years before. And so more now than ever, we really try and do our homework and show, uh, rule out the possibility that this, that this is uh, just, uh, say, a different uh, growth stage of something else. So, right. yeah, we, in addition to saying it's new, you have to really make the point that it's also not <laughs> something else, you know? Right, right. Well, looking at Ceratopsians, for, for the average person, when we look at any members of the Ceratopsian family from the neck back, they look absolutely identical to the average person. So the only variations that seem apparent to us is the variation in the, the frill and the horns and all the, the oddities connected to the skull. So when you did your research, did you discover that their other skeletal ignoring the skull initially, did you find any other identifiers that clearly make it different or is it that ceratopsian bodies are so uniform, it's almost indistinguishable Distinguishable if you don't find the skull? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great question, too. Um, generally, I, I, I think it's fair to say that, generally speaking, most horned dinosaurs, certainly the big ceratopsids, the, the large ones we're familiar with here in North America, uh, are... are very similar, let's say, were you to lop off the head and just look at the remainder of the skeleton. Their skeletons are very, very similar. Um, having said that, I, I think there are probably some differences there that we just haven't really been looking for. Um, there was a skeleton I worked on, actually this is a Museum of Nature specimen that I worked on a few years ago now. Uh, often it's been attributed to an animal called Anchiceratops. Unfortunately, the skeleton's missing the head, but you got the rest of the body there. It was found in Alberta back in the 20s, and it's just a beautifully articulated uh, specimen. You can see all the bones in place. It's one of the few complete horned dinosaur skeletons. And comparing it to some other uh, complete skeletons, there were certainly some differences there as far as, you know, the number of vertebrae in the neck versus the number of vertebrae in the torso, um, you see some shape differences, say in the humerus, which is the upper arm bone. Some have bigger crests than others. Um, there are differences often that we'll see in the hips um, that might distinguish, say, subfamilies of horned dinosaurs, say centrosaurines versus chasmosaurines, or they might distinguish on a finer scale, uh, say, one species from another. Uh, within, let's say, the chasmosaurines, which is just a, a subfamily of these horned dinosaurs. So, yes, I, I agree with you. They, they, by and large, do look very similar. A lot of these animals were probably doing very similar things in their environments, living in uh, roughly the same way. But, but I think a big part of it is we just haven't been looking hard enough sure. to, uh, as horned dinosaur researchers, we tend to put our focus 
on the skull because that's where we're expecting to see the differences. And we don't pay as much attention uh, to what's called the postcranium, so everything in behind the head. And I think it's really just a matter of, of doing our homework a little more and looking a little more closely. And I think we'll start finding that there are more significant differences there than we first thought. Wow. That's neat. Well, I guess it's sort of like you look at antelope in Africa today from the neck back. It's all a pretty uniform body because it's a very effective body. And I guess evolution rewards success. And so why change the body style when all you have to do is change the grill to be hip and cool? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's an easy thing to do. The horned dinosaurs have what we call very plastic frills. That is to say, they're very subject to change. And so it seems like they were, you know, it's as you say, it's an easy thing to change the frill or the horns, the orientation of the horns, uh, rather than, you know, change the entire body plan. So if all you're trying to do, we we certainly think these frills may have been used uh, as a means of signaling between the species. And if you're trying to distinguish yourself as a species, then it's much easier to change, you know, some of the the blips on your frill as opposed to (laughs) give yourself a whole new body shape. So, so then the frills may have acted as sort of a, a billboard, an advertisement that when you're standing out on an open plane and there's 200 other dinosaurs out there, do you think that's sort of an identifier that allows them to say, hey, there's a brother, there's a sister, there's a member of my own species and kind of gravitate towards them? Is that, is that maybe one of the functions of all that stuff? Yeah, that's certainly one of the more popular ideas uh, as far as those frills are concerned. Another idea that's always, you know, gotten a lot of play was this idea that the frills were used as some sort of uh, protection of the neck or a defensive mechanism. Uh, And that's possible, too. Um, You know, it certainly would have helped protect the neck. uh, But one of the arguments against that idea is often horned dinosaur frills, they're not made of solid bone. They've actually got large gaps in them. So Chasmosaurus, for example, gets its name, Chasm Lizard, from the fact that it's got these giant chasms, these giant openings in its frill. And if you're trying to, you know, protect your neck, it doesn't really make much sense to have big openings in the frill that's supposed to cover your neck. Um, so that, that idea has sort of been played down more recently, and increasingly uh, we're thinking more and more that these were display structures of some kind, whether it be for displaying to mates uh, or for displaying to other members of the same species or, or, you know, and and as a means of distinguishing yourself from other species, that's been debated. Um, But I do think there may be something uh, to, for that frill to have been used uh, for defense as well. It's not a, an either or scenario. It could be, you know, both. And, Um, you know, there's often, I've often seen pictures of horned dinosaurs lowering their heads as the predator gets close and lifting that shield off its neck into the air. And they're they're very imposing things to look at. I mean, you go to any museum and you see these things. They're they're very imposing uh, um, frills to look at. So there was probably something there maybe to do with uh, warding off predators as well. Right. Now, in the animal kingdom today, we see a lot of times one sex has a more flamboyant display uh, the peacock is obviously the first thing that comes to mind you you look at a peacock and you look at the hen and they are other body design they're very similar of course but they look completely different so do you think that the variety of horns or the size of the horns or the shape of the frill would have been a displayer to suggest i'm a boy i'm a girl or i'm uh, mature i'm an i'm a sub adult do you think that would have you would you have seen a a difference between the sexes when it comes to the frill that's a really good question because that's something i'm actually working on right now um i would argue no um so what you're what you're describing where the boys basically look different from the girls is what we call sexual dimorphism and all that is to say is that uh the, the males look different from the females. Uh, you can distinguish one from the other, in, in this case, on the basis of the frill. And that's been suggested uh, previously by other dinosaur researchers that uh, male and female horned dinosaurs differed not just in, in, in the details of the frill, but in the orientation of the horns above the eyes as well. 
Um, I would argue that there are probably were no differences between the males and females so far as we can detect. So uh, what I'm not saying is that the females and males look the same, but what I am saying is that we can't tell them apart given the fossils that we have now. We just, I think we just don't have enough fossils to be able to tell them apart because if there were differences, I strongly suspect that they were subtle. And in order to tease apart those subtle differences, we need a lot more fossils uh, than what we have now. We, we basically need to be able to do the math to be able to do the statistics in order to show that you have two discrete or two very different forms uh, that distinguish the males and females. Wow. But, you know, uh, some of those differences might have included uh, color, which is something that typically doesn't fossilize and that may have been very obvious to these animals in life. Maybe, you know, the boys were, uh, I don't know, green and the girls were red, had red frills, uh, and it would have been very obvious to them in life uh, how to distinguish the, the males from the females. But again, color doesn't typically fossilize, and so those are just a s signals that we can't get at. Um, but I would argue that it's, it's very hard to say at this point that uh, the males and females were different, at least as far as the frills are concerned of these horned dinosaurs. Wow. So when you describe Spiclipius, there's no way to tell us whether it's a male or female because you only have the one specimen to look at, right? Nothing to compare it to. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's only the one specimen known. And so um, unfortunately, we weren't able to determine whether Spiclipius was male or female. That, that one specimen was nicknamed Judith, which is typically a, a feminine name, but uh, it was nicknamed after the Judith River Formation, where it came from. It's a rock ah. unit in Montana there. So that's where that name comes from. But whether Judith was male or female, uh, I, I couldn't tell you. And, and it's too bad because there are ways of knowing. We, we are able now to tell some uh, uh, at least uh, we're able to identify positively some female dinosaurs. Uh, if you cut open some of their bones, this was done for um, a female T-Rex recently. There was a special type of bone inside called medullary bone, which is a special type of spongy bone that, um, that uh, egg-laying females deposit um, right before they're forming the eggshell, and they, they draw the calcium from this bone as a source uh, for the eggshell. And so when you see that in a, in a fossilized, in, in a dinosaur, you know that you've got um, a female animal. And unfortunately, we didn't see that in Judith. Uh, and so that means that either Judith was a male or it was female and wasn't forming eggshell. It wasn't laying eggs at that time. So it, you know it when you've got it, that you've got a female, but if it's not there, it's a little more ambiguous as to just what you do have. Um, so there's hope that maybe we'll find more Spiclipius one day and we'll be able to tell the boys from the girls. <laughs> well, so if you ever found a specimen of Spiclipius and it had medullary bone, that then becomes your baseline for now you can scour every inch of the skeleton and utilize that so you can definitively say this is a female. Then you could go back and compare it to yours and say, now that we know which is which, mine is X. Yeah, I think once you have that search image, so to speak, it would be a lot easier to tell the males from the females. If you've, if you've got, say, 100 skeletons and you're able to find medullary bone in 20 of them, then you can say, okay, well, this, is, this 20 is what those females look like. And then you can go back to the rest of the, the 80 other skeletons and go, well, these ones look like the females, but maybe they don't have medullary bone, so they weren't laying eggs, so we can pretty confidently call those females, and the rest are the males. You know, that, that, that'd be the ideal situation. Unfortunately, for dinosaurs, as far as they're concerned, we just don't have those, those numbers of fossils typically. But I think in the ideal scenario, that would be how we'd go about, yeah, distinguishing the boys from the girls. Nice. So your specimen had uh, evidence of injuries. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there's, there's a number of injuries on, on Judith that we found. Uh, some are in the frill. Uh, so if you look at the frill on the left-hand side on what we call the squamosal bone, uh, there are some openings and sort of lesions on the frill um, that look very abnormal. They only occur on one side, 
And uh, basically what it is is um, uh, an ancient bone disease. Uh, and uh, it's hard to say just how the bone became diseased, although really interestingly, if you there's a big hole uh, sort of near the base of the frill on the left-hand side, and, and the, the, the circumference or the diameter of that hole, the size of that hole, roughly corresponds to the circumference of one of Judith's orbital horns, one of the horns over the eyes. And so it's, it's reasonable, anyways, to think that maybe uh, Judith got into a, a fight with a, a conspecific, another member of the same species, and it, it got uh, gored out, <laughs> got this frill gored out uh, by a horn, and then that subsequently became uh, infected. Um, it, it's hard to be sure that that's what happened, but at least... You know, the, the story sort of makes sense of what we're seeing. We do know that a lot of these horned dinosaurs lived in herds, and so presumably they would have, there would have been confrontations, there would have been fights maybe for dominance in the hierarchy or territory or something like that. So that's possible, and, and, and that's interesting to see that on the frill. That's not uncommon to see those injuries on the frill. Uh, another really interesting injury that we saw uh, was evidence for for arthritis and bone disease in the left humerus, which again is, is the upper arm bone, especially towards the elbow. The, the bone there is very, very grotty looking. It's um, just very abnormal looking. It almost looks like uh, it's become very spongy. There's been a lot of uh, bone that's been remodeled and absorbed out of the way. And to the point where the, there's been a large hole that's opened up in the elbow to drain off this infection, this bone infection. Wow. We call it osteomyelitis. And so I had argue, I mean, you should see it. <laughs> actually, if you go on the Museum of Nature website and, and look for Judith, uh, you can actually um, see that, uh, that bone for yourself. There's good pictures of it, or in the, the description, as you said, in PLOS One. But uh, yeah, this, this animal would not have been able to, to move. I, I really don't think on its left limb, so probably is walking long on, on three limbs rather than all four. Um, and that might ultimately be what, what killed Judith. Probably she was, would have been unable to keep up with her herd, and you know she may have been picked off uh, for being too slow by a, by a tyrannosaur or something like that. Um, it, it's really hard to say, but she would have had a very rough life, that's, that's for sure. Boy, you know, in, in order to become a fossil... It, it has as much to do with where you are, right? Dinosaurs that live in the low floodplains may have been more, uh, li- or would be more likely to fossilize than those that live in the upland areas where being buried is less likely. So is it a possibility that the reason why this, this species of dinosaur is rare is maybe they spent more time in areas that weren't as likely, and Judith may be an example of, a group that comes down for migration and leaves, but she's unable to leave or he's unable to leave. So maybe that's why there's only one. That's, that's possible. Yeah. Um, you're, you're absolutely right to say that we don't typically find dinosaurs in ancient upland areas and, and that most of what we do find are occurring in sort of low lying floodplain areas where there's lots of water, lots of sediment being flushed down to, to bury these animals. Yeah. I, it's possible that Judith was an upland animal. We don't really see anything in her skeleton that would suggest that per se. Right. Uh, she looks a lot, you know, if you were, again, if you were to lop the head off, Judith looks a lot like those other lowland dinosaurs. So we think probably her lifestyle would have been very similar to those of the other horned dinosaurs that we know of. Right. Um, Judith's known from, uh, I, I mentioned, comes from the Judith River Formation of Montana, uh, which is generally a... a an ancient floodplain and uh, paleo environment that we're looking at. And for whatever reason, the Judith River Formation has just been very slow to give up its secrets over the years. We've, we've been prospecting it for well over 100 years now, probably closing in on 150 years now. And there's actually been surprisingly little that's come out of it compared to, let's say, uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park uh, in Alberta, uh, where we've been prospecting it for the same amount of time and we found all kinds of fossils. Uh, it's probably just, you know, an upshot of, of just uh, the type of sediment that it's preserved in subtly different environments where you're getting um, more um, water or sediment in one environment versus the other. 
Right. Um, so it's lar- it's partly a result of that too. I think there there are a number of factors. I think that uh, that factor into it. But now now the great thing about Judith is we now know we have a really good idea of what Spiclipius looks like now. And so we can go back over older collections of fossils and look at isolated bones that maybe we couldn't identify before. And we can go back to them now and say, ah, you know what, this actually looks a bit like Spiclipius and maybe that's what that is after all. Um, so we, we have a search image now that we have uh, this animal fully described. Oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. So in order to describe an animal, sometimes you find a bone that you can't identify specifically. So that bone sort of sits in scientific limbo until it can be identified as a match to one that was more complete. That's, that's described. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, and and that happens fairly often. Um, and that's the importance of, of museum collections is, um, you know, you can maintain these, these collections of fossils, uh, for years and years and years, and maybe they'll be ignored for, uh, you know, a certain fossil will be ignored for 50 years just because nobody ever really knew what it was or didn't know what to make of it. And uh, it can become, you know, of renewed interest again um, very suddenly in some cases if uh, something similar was found and someone made sense of it and you can then go back over those old collections and go, aha, you know, this, nice. this neglected bone, we didn't know what it was, finally we know what it is now. Um, and, and actually that kind of happened in the case of, of uh, Spiclipius here. We, we went back and looked over some old fossils uh, that are in the collections of the Museum of Nature here. We always knew that they were horned dinosaur. They come from roughly the same uh, time as, as uh, Spiclipius. And we sort of reinterpreted them uh, in the paper and suggested that actually this, this fossil here, this part of the frill, looks quite a bit like that of the holotype of Spiclipius. And maybe this is the same animal. It's, it's hard to be sure. But certainly we can say they're from very similar animals. And we really didn't know that in, until now. That's pretty cool. Now, when it comes to ceratopsians, I read an article that you, uh, you and your team have also recently or, or in the past year, uh, we're working on a site where a bunch of Centrosaurus bones are. Am I right about that? And can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's right. So we're working in, in a, what's called the Centrosaurus bone bed. Um, so Centrosaurus is another one of these horned dinosaurs. I mentioned the subfamilies of the horned dinosaurs earlier. You get the, the Chasmosaurines and the Centrosaurines. Centrosaurus is one of the centrosaurines, so uh, it, they typically lack horns over the eyes, although that's not always technically true, but certainly the more advanced members generally lack horns over the eyes. Centrosaurus does, and it has a big long horn on the nose, and it's got horns coming off the back of the frill that go off in all kinds of different directions as well. So it's a really cool critter. And we know uh, from Dinosaur Park uh, that Centrosaurus occurs in these bone beds, and on the basis of these bones beds, which contain which can contain hundreds or thousands of broken up skeletons, that these animals were were herding animals. And I've been working um, east of Dinosaur Provincial Park in on the South Saskatchewan River in southeast Alberta uh, in a very large uh, bone bed system out there of of horned dinosaurs of, of these Centrosaurus, and so. Uh, that bone bed stretches for 2.3 square kilometers. God. It's been known since the 50s. It was identified uh, as being a bone bed of uh, a vast mega bone bed, we call it, of horned uh, dinosaurs back in the 90s uh, by a crew at the Tyrrell Museum in Alberta. And I've since been going back to collect more of that bone bed um, in order to learn more and more about uh, Centrosaurus learn about its herd structure, learn about, again, the differences between the males and the females. Uh, You can learn a lot about how dinosaurs grew up if you have a bone bed because you typically get lots of different members of different uh, ages found within the bone bed. So, you know, it's nice to get these isolated, complete skeletons, but that will only tell you about an individual dinosaur. In the case of these bone beds, we don't get complete skeletons typically, but what you do get is thousands of thousands of bones from lots of different individuals 
that can teach you about those very things I just said, herd structure and, and development of these animals. So they're, they're special in their own regard. God, that, that is so amazing. I can't imagine what that must be like. And, and of course, my understanding of those bone beds is they're almost like a gigantic thousand piece jigsaw puzzle that somebody threw the pieces up in the air. And so there's no, you don't have dozens of dinosaurs laying pristinely. You know, we see images like, for instance, uh, uh, like the Ashfall, Nebraska site where the animals laid down, were buried, died, and their skeletons are perfectly laid out. That's not what these bone beds you're working on are like, right? No, not at all. It's very much a mishmash of bones. And sometimes the bones are, are broken. You know, these bone beds, after all these animals died, uh, some of the bones would have been washed away and redeposited by the rivers that the animals died next to. There was certainly lots of evidence of predator activity. So you get these scavengers, in, in most cases, tyrannosaurs coming into the area and eating the animals and mixing the bones up even more. Wow. So they're certainly not you know, pristine, uh, articulated, you know, bone to bone skeletons. But what you do get is a mishmash. Although, you know, having said that, the bone bed we were working in this year, we did find a sort of a pseudo articulated skull where the frill bone connects to the, the back of the, the skull. So the, the, around the eye socket. And then we had some of the jaw bones where we expect them to be. So, you know, you get the odd surprise, but, but by and large, yeah, these are just a mishmash of of individuals and you you can get estimate the number of individuals in the bone bed based on uh, counting certain bones so we all have we you know we all have one left femur one left thigh bone right. and so if you're able to count the number of left thigh bones in your bone bed you can get a rough estimate for for how many individuals there are there minimally you might have more than that but uh, you can get a, a, a minimum number of individuals uh, if you count, say, the left thigh bones or the left uh, shoulder blades or something like that. That's brilliant. That's really cool. I never would have, I would have thought heads. And then you hope that the skull is with the piece, but oftentimes it's not. Well, yeah, you hope the skull's there. Typically we don't, you know, you're lucky if you can find a skull in your bone bed. And, and we've been lucky so far. We've, we've got two nice frills out of the bone bed so far. We've only opened up maybe four or five square meters. Wow. We've got another, we estimate that our area of this mega bone bed that I mentioned is, is probably 20 by 20 square meters. God. And uh, we've only up and up, you know, a fraction of that where I've already got two, uh, two nice frills out of it. So wow. I'm pretty excited about that. Man. And uh, hopefully we'll get more next year. Boy, that's exciting. That's exciting. Well, talk a little bit about you, the museum. You know, I, I went to the museum website and, and for everybody listening uh, the museum is the Canada or the Canadian Museum of Nature, and it's in Ottawa, Canada. Um, anybody that uh, that is in that area, you've got to go see it. Their website is nature.ca backslash en backslash home, and I'll put a link to this. So talk a little bit about the museum. What can people see if they come there? Uh, well, we've certainly got dinosaurs, as I mentioned. This is where I cut my teeth learning about dinosaurs when I was a kid. And that's, of course, my favorite thing. But uh, we've got a number of different galleries here beyond just the dinosaurs and, and fossil mammals, I should add. Uh, we've got a water gallery where you, where you can learn a lot about uh, Canada's uh, water systems, rivers and oceans. We've got a, a full, fully um, skeletonized whale mounted in the water gallery so you can go see that that's pretty cool we've got an excellent uh, exhibit on canada's um, mammals so uh, bear and cougars and there's uh, buffalo there uh, those were always some of my favorites as a kid too looking at those old mammal displays we've got an excellent bird gallery um, and we're working right now on an arctic gallery that's slated to open uh, next year in 2017 for Canada's 150th birthday. Uh, so we're pretty excited uh, about that. And that, that will also feature uh, some Arctic fossils as well. So we'll have fossils not just in the dinosaur gallery, but in the Arctic gallery as well, which I'm, I'm pretty excited about. It's just a really great museum as far as covering, uh, you know, Canada's natural history, which is we're located in, in Canada's capital here in Ottawa. And that's what we're all about is 
highlighting uh, Canada's natural history. Wow. Now, you can also see the fossil bones and a reconstruction of the skull of Spiclipius. It's on display at the museum through November 13th, 2016, right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, back in May, when the announcement was made, uh, Spiclipius uh, was was named, um, the bones, uh, at least some of them, went on display in the gallery downtown. And uh, you could see not just the real bones for yourself, but also the reconstructed skull. Um, and we have some video there that you can see uh, just going a little more into the science uh, behind uh, the naming of the dinosaur and going into some of the details about the pathologies that I mentioned, those, those diseased uh, bones. Uh, you can get up and close with Judith's left humerus that I mentioned has that bone disease and see it for yourself. And yes, that exhibit, uh, which takes up one of the corners in the fossil gallery right now, is on display till November, after which point the plan is to dismantle it. But the Judith skull reconstruction will still remain in the gallery. It'll be a permanent part uh, of the gallery now, so you can, you can see it for yourself, you know, ad infinitum as much as you like going forward. <laughs> Well, he is a research scientist and a biological paleontologist for the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, Canada. Dr. Jordan Mallon and his new dinosaur is Spiclipius Shaporum. Dr. Mallon, I cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule. I, I've seen online the kind of stuff you're involved in, so I appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Well, thank you for your interest, George, and uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. So uh, thanks again. I had a lot of fun. Well, that was a really exciting interview. What a, what a, what a great paleontologist Dr. Mallon is. Um, I really recommend you guys go to the website and look him up. Uh, and if you live anywhere near that area in, uh, in Ottawa, you've got to go by and visit uh, that museum. When we come back, we'll answer a couple of Ask Dinosaur George questions. Did you know that our online store is not just about dinosaurs? We have a huge collection of modern replica skulls, including mammals, sea life, reptiles, birds, and more. And teachers, these skulls are great for the classroom. Show your students the skull of a dodo bird, great auk, or Tasmanian wolf. The majority of these skulls are cast from original specimens from the California Academy of Sciences. Go to store.dinosaurgeorge.com to see our complete line of museum-quality casts and replicas. It's time to ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents' permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. All right, let's answer some of the questions submitted by you. You can submit them either by phone, calling us at 210-888-9077, or go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page. This first one is from Noah from Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. My buddy Noah. Hey, George, I've decided one dinosaur I want in this comic he's going to write is a carnosaur of some kind. Do you know of one that would be interesting? Thanks. P.S. I'm thinking of having you in the story as a cameo. Well, Noah, I'm honored that you would consider doing that. I think that's really cool and I think it'd be a lot of fun. Please make sure I don't get eaten. The dinosaur that I wonder would be interesting to pick. What about a Delta Dromius? Delta Dromius is, is a wicked sounding dinosaur. And what's really cool about him is he might be sort of neat because you could, you could, I mean, the evidence suggests he's fast, so you could make him a very you know, very swift predator in your book. So anyway, I don't know. That's, that's a good one. I su uh, suspect. All right, Frank from Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, hello, Mr. Blossing. I am having fun making the, I, I hope you're having fun making the podcast and that friend's book is going well. <laughs> All right, Frank, you're, you're banned Frank from ever writing back again. <laughs> First, let, let me tell you, and Frank, I appreciate uh, Mr., but please always call me George or DG or whatever. All right, his, his smart remark about friend's book. I confused Facebook 
and what was the other one? What was the other one that that was popular? Something Friends. I can't remember which the other one was now. But anyway, I I made the mistake of lumping them together and calling it Friends Book. And I've never heard the end of it. So, <laughs> Frank, I'm coming to Stratford, Connecticut, but it isn't for pleasure. Well, for me it is, but it won't be for you. <laughs> All right. Here's Frank's question. Uh, what are your top three favorite dinosaurs? I know your number one is Allosaurus, so what are the other two? Mine are Ceratosaurus, Tarbosaurus, and Displetosaurus. Thanks for answering my questions, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Frankie boy. It's good to hear from you. Thank you for harassing me. That was really kind. Um, <laughs> my top three, Allosaurus, Deinonychus, Utah Raptor. Those are the, my top three dinosaurs that I like the most. But I got to tell you, over the last couple of years, I've really fallen in love with the ankylosaurs and the ceratopsians. I'm just finding them to be so fascinating because of the variety and different uh, configuration. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by them. Okay, Camden from Brooklyn, uh, Connecticut. Uh, hey, DG, I hope you're doing well. I am, Camden. Thank you for asking. Do you think that tyrannosaurs would have hunted in packs? In my opinion, I don't think they would have because an animal of that size and brutality wouldn't need a pack to be a successful hunter. Thank you for your time and have a nice day. Thank you, Camden. That's very kind of you. I guess there's two ways to look at it, Camden. Yeah, that's a big dinosaur and he's certainly capable of holding his own. But the benefit of hunting in a group cooperatively means that you can do so many more things that you can't do when you're by yourself. In other words, you can, if you're hunting with a group, you can either wear down the prey by almost doing a relay, chasing it around uh, one person or one animal chases while the others kind of catch their breath sort of thing. And you ultimately wear them out. That's one advantage. But the real big advantage is the ability to ambush the prey, uh, the use of diversions. You know, if you've got two buddies with you, uh, one of you can stand out in the open to draw everybody's attention. And while they're staring at your friend in the open, the other ones are coming up from behind or from the side. Those are successful ways to do it. The other thing is that you can place your your partners in crime in various locations so that when the herd scatters, chances are somebody is going to run right into the waiting mouth not the waiting arms, but the waiting mouth of your other Tyrannosaur friends. So I think there's benefits to hunting in a pack. And I think in order to survive Tyrannosaurus, even as big as he was, and even as monstrous as he was, might have taken advantage of that. All right. Uh, my little bro, Zach from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Uh, Zach is, is somebody that I've referred to as my little bro for years. So Zach writes, dear big bro, George, first up, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Zach. And I hope you're doing well. I hope your family's doing well. And I hope you are ready for the new, uh, NFL football season. He says, I have a random question. Hope it is unique. I was thinking about the slash and dash technique that the Raptors use. And I'm wondering if any of the bigger theropods would have used a similar method, cause a deadly wound and then let the animal bleed out. I'm thinking that it would be something that Allosaurus could do against something like a Stegosaurus. Thanks for your time. Your little bro, Zach PS, get your butt up to the Berg sometimes, bro. Zach, I, I plan. I honestly do try to plan on getting back up to Pennsylvania one of these days. And when I do you and me and your family are going to have dinner. All right. Um, you know, yes, Certainly the big predators would have incorporated something like a slash and dash, meaning you go in and you inflict a big wound and then you get out of there. And that's for survival. It makes all the sense in the world that you don't want to stand there and fight with the possibility of being injured in return. So, yes, Zach, I do think that would be a very effective way to be able to hunt and uh, and not get yourself killed, because the biggest problem with being a theropod is how dangerous life can be, especially when you're out there hunting and killing things that have no intention of being eaten and that can fight back. All right, uh, Chris from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Hey, Dinosaur George, hope your podcasts are going well. Thank you, Chris. I hope you're enjoying them. I was wondering about the sexual dimorphism of certain dinosaurs. Some people claim that female dinosaurs may have been bigger than males or vice versa. What is your opinion on the subject? And you think it might have varied between species? Wow, what a great question, Chris. Yes, I do. Now, for those of you that may not recognize the word sexual dimorphism, what that means 
is there is a visible difference between the male and females. Uh, in some cases, it could have been color. In some cases, it might have been things like ornamentation. Um, so there's there's ways that dinosaurs would have been able to differentiate girl from boy, male from female. So do I think that uh, it's possible? I do. Now, maybe size would have been the different d- differentiation a big word size may have been one of the differentiations that other dinosaurs could have seen so if they see a group of dinosaurs and they see one giant one when they may suspect or they may know that means it's a female or that means it's a male um i don't know you know earlier in in the interview that i was able to do one of the things that dr mallon said is he's not quite sure that we would have seen a dramatic difference in the horn configuration of ceratopsians so there may not have been a big sexual dimorphism between them maybe it would have been color so um yeah i think it's possible but do we know that for certain i just don't know but uh i suspect there's got to be a way to recognize what is a male what is a female from a distance okay daniel from dublin ireland uh hey sir how's your day and my question is do you think raptors from different types of raptor groups could form a pack hey daniel nice question first let me tell you i've got to get to ireland that is where my mother's side of the family came from we're irish and i really want to get back home one day just to see that magnificent uh, country plus i have a couple of very good friends that live in ireland uh, ireland and one of which i've got to come see before he grows up and becomes an adult and doesn't like dinosaurs anymore so would different raptors from different species form a pack you know i don't i don't know daniel that's an interesting question i don't see it that often in the modern animal kingdom you know lions want to hunt with lions um uh cheetahs want to hunt with cheetahs um you know animals you know hyenas stay together and wolves stay together and and coyotes stay together and i don't know if they would have any tolerance for anything other than uh, members of their own family. But that's a very, very good question. That's a very interesting question, in fact. Okay, let's see if we can do one more here. Um, Alex from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Alex asks, is Sorophaganax, if Sorophaganax and Epantarius fought each other, who would win? Well, you know, Alex, there's a lot of people that believe Sorophaganax is Epantarius. And that Epantarius is Sorophaganax, and that they're both Allosaurus. <laughs> you know, they're, they're such rare dinosaurs, it's very difficult to know for certain if indeed they are the same animal or if they were different. Um, based on what I know about each, they seem to be about the same size. And um, so, you know, they have about the same size, maybe the same weapons. So who can say for certain? I, I don't know. I, I wish I did. All right, you guys, that is it for this podcast. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Please follow me on Facebook and in Twitter. If you go to my podcast page, which is dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com, you will see links to all of those. Uh, also, uh, visit my store. Uh, store.dinosaurgeorge.com I hope you find something there that you like to help me pay the bills and lastly go to my website dinosaurgeorge.com until next time everybody thank you so much and keep digging for clues about our past thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list if you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event please visit our website